Genesis chapter 3. We're going to begin in verse 9. Consequences of sin. The consequences of sin. Now, as I was writing the sermon this week, I kept hearing the voice of my father in the back of my head. And so the outline came directly from things that I heard from my father growing up. Son, your sin will find you out. And son, your sin will cost you. And then there was one more thing that I heard, and it was, son, don't do stupid. Okay, but that wasn't actually in the biblical text. That was just kind of a house rule. Don't do anything stupid. Okay, some of you parents may want to incorporate that, and, or maybe you already have into the instructions you give your kids. I didn't realize it at the time, but my dad basically gave me the outline of what happened to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. I didn't understand at that moment what he was doing, but he helped me to understand the big picture of what was happening here in Genesis chapter 3. So if we start in verse 8, here's what the text records for us. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now, in this passage, we're going to see that you cannot hide from God when you sin. And you cannot escape the natural or the specific consequences of your sin. Look at how Adam and Eve began in this particular passage. They heard, they discerned that the Lord God, that is Yahweh God, was walking in the garden in the cool of day and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Was God unaware of where they were? He was not. He knew exactly where they were. And then when you look at verse 9, you see God calls out. The Lord God calls out to the man, where are you? God was not unaware. He knew exactly where they were. But by asking the question, where are you? It draws attention to the fact that Adam and Eve were trying to hide themselves as a result of their sin. And so despite your best efforts, despite your most careful planning, your sin will be discovered. Now, maybe it's not going to be discovered by your wife or your siblings, or your parents, or your employer, but there is one person, one being in all the universe who knows what your sin is, and that is Yahweh God. And you can never, ever hide your sin from him. Now, this brings us to a point of discerning the natural consequences to sin. So these what we are going to look at in the first point, okay, your sin will find you out. We are going to be looking at what our reaction is when we sin. And then we're also going to be looking at the natural consequences to sin. So these are not spelled out for us in the text, but you can discern them through careful reading, okay? So what is the first natural consequence regarding sin? Well, it is this, that sin breaks fellowship. Sin breaks fellowship. Look at what happened. Verse 8, the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. If sin didn't break fellowship, why would they have to hide? They would have no reason to hide. In fact, we are to, imply, uh, to understand from the text that the natural course of their relationship with Yahweh God was a regular meeting time with Yahweh, a daily meeting with Yahweh. And here, in this particular instance, instead of going out to meet him, instead of, themsel instead of allowing themselves to be discovered, they hid themselves from Yahweh. So the first natural consequence of sin is that it breaks fellowship. 
And this phrase that we encounter, the Lord God was walking in the garden, is it one of the ways and one of the phrases that is used by Moses in the book of Genesis to describe people who have a right and appropriate relationship with God. Think about that. Enoch walked with God in Genesis 5, 22 and 24. Enoch was a righteous man. Noah also walked with God. Genesis chapter 6, verse 9. The text of Scripture, Genesis, doesn't specifically say that Abraham walked with God, but when God told Abraham to go, he went. He walked according to the command of Yahweh. Elsewhere, the text of Scripture says that Abraham was a friend of God. Again, describing the close relationship that they had together. And so Adam and Eve also had that relationship with God. And because of sin, instead of coming to fellowship with Yahweh, they hid themselves from Yahweh. And so what, you, what should you discern from this? You already know the answer. When you sin against somebody, it breaks fellowship. It breaks relationships. It puts a barrier between you and the one who is sinned against. Now, we're going to talk about how to reconcile that barrier in a little while, but you need to understand that one of the first natural consequences of sin is that your sin will be discovered, and upon this uh, discovery, your sin breaks fellowship with that person, breaks fellowship with them. Think about trust that's violated when someone lies. Okay? Think about hurts that are um, cultivated when there's disobedience in a family relationship or in an employer-employee relationship. Sin breaks fellowship. Yet, despite the fact that fellowship was broken, God's graciousness towards the sinner is plainly seen. What could God have done? God was in heaven when Adam and Eve sinned. What could God have done the moment that they sinned? He could have wiped them out. You know, the image that came to my mind was the image of uh, the, the, the false god Zeus in Roman mythology, Greek and Roman mythology. Zeus was the god who had the mansion on the mountaintop, and he was fond of throwing lightning bolts at people, okay? That, that's the first image that came to my mind when you're thinking, okay, they sinned against God. What could God have done to them? He could have like zapped them with these lightning bolts and just, bam, annihilated them. But he didn't do that. Rather, his graciousness is evident in his interaction with them. God could have forcefully confronted Adam, but instead he asked him a question. Where are you? And then in verse 10, we see Adam giving the reason why he was hiding. I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And God could have said, well, of course you did. You violated my command. How dare you, Adam? But instead, he said this, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? God's gracious interaction with Adam was to ask him questions that would draw out the sin from Adam's own mouth. That's what confession is. Confession is when you agree with God that you have sinned, when you have, that you have violated his holy standards. And confession is the first step to forgiveness. Confession. Not saying, I'm sorry. It's a specific confession of what you have done. So Adam should have said, God, I know that you commanded me not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but I broke your law and I ate from that tree. Please forgive me, God. That's a confession. When you name the specific sin that you have committed. And so God, in his graciousness, was trying to draw that out of Adam. He was trying to draw the truth out of Adam. Now, we see in Adam's statement that the second natural consequence of sin is that it brings shame. 
it brings shame. Sin brings shame. I don't know other, any other word that would describe what Adam felt in verse 10. I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Adam felt shame. Now, I, I want you to understand a distinction here. There's a difference between shame and guilt. Many times we say, I feel guilty. Well, guilt is a word that describes the legal result of your action. It's a, it's a legal term. In other words, guilt means that you have violated a law or a statute. So there are people who are guilty but do not feel ashamed because they have seared their conscience and no longer does their conscience prick them or send up a warning flag when they sin. All right, so when, when you say, I feel guilty, what you're actually saying is, I feel shame. Shame is the feeling that is associated with being a lawbreaker. Shame is the feeling. Guilt is the fact. And there are times where you can confess your sin. Please forgive me, God, I have sinned against you by doing X, Y, Z. And God forgives you at that moment. 1 John 1, 9, if we are, confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We are legally declared righteous when God forgives us. The sin has been washed off of the slate. But there are times when even though we have been declared legally righteous, we still feel the sense of shame that accompanies sin. Why? Because now you have to deal with the consequences of that sin. Now you have to deal with the fallout of that sin. There are reminders in your life that will point back to the sin that you committed. And my friends, that is the feeling of shame. And that's exactly what Adam was feeling here. Now God in his graciousness continues to question Adam. Who told you that you were naked? Apparently, God had never told Adam that he was naked. In fact, the text of Scripture says in chapter 2, verse 25, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now, all of a sudden, they were naked and ashamed. What changed? The fact of guilt changed. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, there was no guilt on their account. They had not broken God's law. Here, once we get to Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, after they had eaten of the fruit which God commanded them not to eat, the fruit of the tree which God commanded them not to eat, now they are feeling shame and they associate it with their nakedness. Adam was ashamed because he had violated God's law. Now, God's next question gets straight to the point. Did you eat from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? I want you to notice something about these questions that God has asked. Where are you? Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? What did Jesus say about himself and the Father? They came to do what? Seek, seek, and save that which was lost. Are there, are there sinners who are running to Jesus? Or are sinners opposed to Jesus and God chases them down? God seeks them. God meets them. God has elected them and God has given the means by which they can be converted from their sinful state to a state of righteousness, and it is through the gospel of Jesus Christ. What I want you to notice here is the first example of God seeking and saving that which was lost. This is a powerful, powerful reality because the plan and the pattern of redemption has not changed, has it? It has not changed. Romans chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. I want you to turn here. 
and see this. Romans chapter 5. I'm actually going to start in verse 6. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Were you running towards God? No, you were the enemy of God. And at the right time, Christ died for you, his enemy. And at the right time, God called you to a knowledge of his son through the preaching of the gospel. And what's the result of that? Romans chapter 5, verse 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies... We were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Look, God has a pattern of how he practices redemption. And it is always Yahweh and Jesus Christ seeking the lost and using the means of the gospel to bring them to salvation. Now, gospel means good news. Did, uh, did God actually preach about the death of burial and resurrection of Jesus to Adam and Eve? No. We'll discover soon that he gave that in a seed thought. Adam and Eve and Abraham and Enoch and Noah and every other saint in the Old Testament were saved, not on the basis of their good works, but on the basis of their faith in the promise of God and what he told him or what God told them at that particular time. That's how they were saved. Their faith in the words and the promises of God. And so God was drawing Adam to him through these questions. Now, Adam doesn't do himself any favors. In verse 12, after God asks him, have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you not to eat? Adam says this, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. Notice, our natural response to discovery is blame shifting. Adam shifted the blame to Eve. And then in verse 13, the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So Adam shifted the blame to Eve. Eve shifted the blame to the serpent. And none of you have ever shifted the blame to anybody else, right? No. What, we are just like our first parents. When we sin, we try to hide, but it gets discovered. And then when it is discovered, our response to discovery is to blame shift. Well, it was actually somebody else who made me do this. I tell you what, I'm going to go back to my father again. When I told my dad that the neighbor boy or my brother caused me to sin, I got more spankings than when I just confessed that I was being stupid and sinning on my own free will. He never accepted blame shifting as a means for uh, sin. So, so once again, in the back of my mind, you know, dad's voice is there, okay? You sinned on your own volition. You can't blame somebody else. And yet that's our natural tendency. Adam didn't just blame the woman, he also blamed God. And I find this to be particularly egregious. Notice what Adam says, verse 12. The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave from the tree and I ate. Now Adam was singing a different tune about the woman just a few verses before, right? In Genesis chapter 2, the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She'll be, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. He was so delighted that God had brought the woman to him. And now he's like, God, you, you did this to me. I didn't ask for this woman. You gave her to me. We do that all the time. 
Well, God, you didn't give me what I wanted. Or you gave me too much of what I wanted. Or it was your fault in some way, shape, or form, God. We do that. We do exactly what Adam did. We blame other people, and then we ultimately blame God. And so God, God doesn't even give Adam's uh, response the time of day. He basically just moves to the woman and says, well, what did you do? What did you do? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And then God has to bring some consequences to bear upon them, some spelled out specific consequences. Oh, do, do we think though, before we move on from this passage, this portion of the text, do we think though, that God is the one who tempted Adam and Eve? Did God tempt Adam by giving Eve to him? Did, did God tempt Eve by allowing Satan to possess the body of the serpent and the serpent speak to him? Was God responsible for that in some way, shape, or form? Well, the answer is no. According to James chapter 1, verse 13, James writes this, God does not tempt anyone with evil. But each one is tempted when he is enticed by his own lust or desires. Okay. And all right. Each one is tempted when he is enticed by his own lust. Does the text of Genesis chapter three say this? Sure it does. Look back at Genesis chapter three, verse six. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. She took from its fruit and ate, and she gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Whose desire was it? It was Eve's desire. And then it was Adam's desire to not see his wife suffer the consequences alone. And so he ate as well. Furthermore, God is not the one who brings temptation, but he is the one who provides the way of escape for every temptation that you will ever face in your life. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. So many of us find temptations in a lot of different places. And the, the exit is obvious for those temptations, but we're not willing to take the exit ramp. I, I think of this in terms of, you know, like um, looking at sinful things on the internet, pornography and such. Every internet browser I've ever used has a little X up in the corner. And if you push that, whatever you're looking at disappears. I mean, it's really easy to click the X. But a lot of times we don't click the X. Click around, click something else. Now that's just an obvious example, an easy example that we can see. But the temptation, the way of escape is right there. But we often are unwilling to take the off-ramp. We just want to see how far can we actually get with this sin? How, how bad are the consequences really? How, God's forgiving, right? God's gracious. He'll, he'll understand that this was just a moment of weakness. These are the rationalizations that we go over and over in our mind. And then when our sin does find us out, we shift the blame and all of a sudden it's God's fault instead of us saying, well, God gave me 10 ways to get out of this, but I didn't take any of the 10. That's what we do. So brothers and sisters, my exhortation to you is that when you sin, don't follow Adam and Eve's pattern. Don't try to hide it. Confess it immediately once you realize it. And then don't shift the blame. Bear the consequences. So in this passage, we saw two natural consequences, one being shame and the other being broken fellowship. Deal with your sin quickly. 
so that those consequences don't linger in your life. Now, that's just the unstated consequences to sin. God, in this particular passage, brings some stated consequences to Adam and Eve and to the serpent. Okay? Now, I want you to understand that we are looking here at specific consequences to particular sins. These consequences may not apply to you because you cannot sin in the exact same way as Adam and Eve did. However, you do bear the consequences of their sin. So in in the Old Testament, sometimes you'll find a passage that talks about the iniquities of the fathers will be visited upon the children of the third and fourth generation. It doesn't mean that God is holding those children responsible for the father's sins. What it means is the consequences, the natural repercussions of sin will have a three to four generation effect upon the family. And you, you, we could probably go around this auditorium this morning and find examples of that. People who you know who have sinned greatly in their life and you see the effects of that sin, the consequences of that sin in the second, in the third, in the fourth generation beyond when the actual sin was committed. Now, another truth that we can discern, big picture from verses 14 through 19 is this, that even though there was sin on the part of the serpent and the woman and Adam, not every sin receives the same uh, strength of consequence or the same uh, severity of consequence. In the text, in God's declaration, in verse 14 and verse 17, To the serpent and to Adam, he says that they are cursed. But to the woman, he doesn't say that she is cursed. But did she sin? Yeah, she did. What was different about her sin? She was tricked into it. She was deceived. And so God does not pronounce as severe of a consequence upon her. Now, you ladies may be disagreeing, especially those of you who had children. Okay? (laughs) But nonetheless, you are not cursed in the same way that the serpent was cursed and Adam was cursed. You still have to bear a consequence, but not a curse. So let's take a look now at the serpent's consequence. Okay, remember we discussed last week that the serpent is not just a snake. It is a snake, but it is a snake who is being possessed by Satan, the arch enemy of God and the arch enemy of humanity, all mankind. So there is actually a dual curse pronounced upon the serpent. Verse 14 describes how the serpent, the actual animal, will be treated in God's creation. And verse 15 deals specifically with the spiritual being who empowered the serpent, that is Satan. Okay, so let's take a look at verse 14. How is the serpent cursed more than all the cattle and beasts of the field? All right, we know that all of creation, so the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, all the created things that are on the earth, the the trees, the grass, the fish, the birds, all the animals, all of it suffers from the corruption of the curse of sin. Well, how is the serpent cursed more than all the other animals? One way that the serpent is cursed more than all the other animals is that snakes are almost universally despised by every culture. Almost every culture despises snakes. And so the reputation of that animal is one that elicits fear and danger and loathing. All right? And snakes will never escape that. They will never escape that, recommend, or that uh, reputation. A second way that the serpent is cursed above all animals is that it is said that the serpent will go on its belly and eat dust all the days of its life. Now, I don't think personally, this is my personal belief, I don't believe that the serpent at one point had legs and then now does not have legs. I believe that this is a, that saying on your belly you will go is a description of the physical means of transportation of the serpent that then leads to the actual curse, all and dust you will eat all the days of your life. This particular phrase 
dust you will eat all the days of your life, is a phrase that describes abject humiliation. Abject humiliation. All right. We can discern this from how this phrase is used elsewhere in the Old Testament. In Psalm 72, verses 8 and 9, talking about the rule of the righteous branch of Yahweh, listen to what it says. May he also rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Let the nomads uh, of the deserts bow before him and his enemies lick the dust. So if the enemies are licking the dust, what is that a sign of? Humiliation, defeat, all right? And, and I think that's exactly what we are to remember about the serpent, that he has been defeated, all right? Even if he's not presently, I mean, he is defeated in a literal sense, but figuratively, God is allowing the serpent, that is Satan, to have space to rule on this earth and to do some things that are contrary to God's kingdom. But he has to check in with God all the time. All right, Job chapter 1 tells us that Satan and all the demons go to God's throne and check in to see what they can do. So yes, God has given Satan some rule, some authority, some freedom, but he's, he has as much freedom as a puppet on a string. He can do only what the master says. So this phrase, dust you will eat all the days of your life, describes his personal humiliation and also the fact that he has been defeated. Even if not literally right now, one day he will certainly be defeated. And that actually leads well into the spiritual uh, element of this curse in verse 15. God says this, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. So what, what is happening now is God is describing the conflict that is going to happen between Satan and those who would follow him and the woman and her offspring. So there's going to be a, a constant conflict between Satan and his seed, those who follow him, and it could even include human beings, okay, and the woman and her seed, which would be those who are descendants of Adam and Eve, who actually are believers in Yahweh. In general, it means all of mankind. There is enmity between the serpent and all of mankind, but you could take it specifically as well. Satan's offspring, the woman's offspring, those who don't believe and those who do believe. This is why we have conflict in our world. We have basically two groups of people in the world. Those who are unbelievers, who worship themselves, who worship any God of their own design, any God that they fashion from their own imagination. And you have believers who worship the one true God. And then here we have the seed form of the plan of redemption in the second half of verse 15. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. And this is specifically referring to one seed. He shall bruise you on the head. One, one of Eve's descendants will bruise the serpent on the head, but the serpent will bruise him on the heel. Now you all, because you have the entire canon of scripture, know who this is talking about. It's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the first messianic prophecy in all of scriptures. The first prophecy that, record, that points to the plan of redemption that God had in mind from even before the creation of the world that we read about in Genesis chapter 1. So, interestingly, he shall bruise you on the head. The idea that is communicated here is that this bruise on the head, this blow, is a fatal blow. All right. That is the seed of the woman who is going to deal that blow to the head of the serpent. But the serpent will bruise the seed of the woman on the heel. Okay? The serpent will bruise the woman or bruise the seed of the woman on the heel. When did that happen? It happened on the cross of Calvary. Satan thought that putting Jesus to death on that cross would be the way 
to defeat his enemy. But it was actually God's means of redemption. And so, yes, was Christ bruised? Yes, that was a temporary death. It was temporary. That's what a bruise is, a temporary wound. It lasted all of three days. And then God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, conquering the power of sin and death and sealing the destruction and the defeat of Satan. This is why Jesus Christ will bruise him on the head. This doesn't mean that Satan is at the present time somehow bound, at the present time somehow unable to effect life on this planet. What it does mean, though, is that the end of the story is written. We know how it ends now. Jesus accomplished it on the cross of Calvary, and God the Father confirmed it with the resurrection of Christ from the dead. And so the serpent receives this twofold curse, one against the animal itself, and a second against Satan, the being who possessed the animal. Now verse 16, the woman's consequence. To the woman, he said this, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. The two consequences that God gives to Eve for her sin are directly related to her created purpose. What was Eve's purpose? What was Eve's created purpose? First of all, she was created to be a helpmate to Adam. That means one who comes alongside, one who follows, okay? That was her first created purpose. And her second created purpose is to be what? The one who bears children so that, Adam, so that the, our original parents could fulfill the command to be fruitful and to multiply. And so the consequences that Eve receive speak directly to her two created purposes. And God does it kind of in a reverse order. First, he says, we're going to make childbirth difficult. So childbirth was originally to be a joy and it was to be ease. It was to be a great experience. But the text is very clear. Even in the English, you can see the intensification of what's going to happen. You're moving from basically a small discomfort to great pain. All right? Small discomfort to great pain. I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you will bring forth children. God communicates very clearly that the process of not only conceiving children, but also bringing them into this world, the natural process of bringing this into the world, will be painful. And most every woman that I've ever known who has born a child has experienced great pain in childbirth. Some more so than others. But still, this pain is amplified far beyond what God originally intended. So her ability to bear children with relative ease was cursed. Not, I shouldn't say cursed. It, was, it became a, a consequence. The pain became a consequence. Secondly, her desire to be a helpmate her natural inclination to follow Adam was now corrupted. As a helpmate, Eve was created to have this natural desire to follow Adam's lead. There was no competition. There was no butting of heads. There was no um, subversiveness in their original relationship. Eve's desire was to do all that Adam had commanded her to do. But now that desire will be perverted. Now that desire will be thwarted. This word desire is used only three times in the Old Testament. It's used here in Genesis 3.16. It's used in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. And it's also used in Song of Solomon. And I think in interpreting this word and what it means, it's 
essential to understand how the author of Genesis was using it because it's used in such close context with one another. So look in your Bible at Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. God is speaking to Cain. Again, let's just pick up in verse 6. God is speaking to Cain. The same pattern is evident. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. In Genesis 3.16 and in Genesis 4.7, the context of the word desire is used in relationship to some other governing body or governing agent. In Genesis 3.16, the governing agent is Adam. In Genesis 4.7, the governing agent is sin. And the desire is to rule over. And you have to tamp that desire down. You have to refute that desire. You have to fight against that inclination. And so the desire that the woman experiences it is a desire to rule her husband, to be the leader of the family, to no longer be the helpmate, but to be the one who is, shall we say, in the driver's seat, making all the decisions. This is the natural effect of the consequence of sin for women. And this is confirmed when we look at the New Testament and we see, what does God command women to do in marriage? To be subject to their husbands, to be submissive to their husbands. We can find examples of that command also in the Old Testament. Okay, now this is not to say that women in some way, shape, or form are less equal than men or inferior to men or less valuable than men. No, women are intrinsically equal to men. Women have the same intrinsic value as men do because they are both created in the image of God. What has changed is the desires. Women will have this desire to rule, but what? Their husbands will rule over them. Why? Because they're bigger, stronger, more aggressive, and more powerful. And in most of the cultures all around the world, women have been uh, oppressed by men. That's a true statement because of the curse. That's a, that's a conse consequence of sin. And there are, there are really only two books, two, two, two series of writings, two books of writings, if you will, that have resulted in women being treated on an equal stature with men. And the, the first one is the Old Testament law, and the second one are the epistles in the New Testament. Both of those books elevate women and give them an equal standing in society, not equal function, not equal role, but treat them as equal citizens under the law. So we cannot say that this desire uh, means that women deserve what they get, okay? They do not deserve the oppression that has happened to them. But the natural effect of that and the natural effect of sin in the heart of, me of men is to oppress women, okay? So these are the two ways that the woman was affected by the consequence of sin. Now, to Adam, God said this, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and you have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread till you return to the ground because from it you were taken. For you are dust and to dust you shall return. In the prefix to the curse in verse 17, God refutes Adam's excuses. Look at this. Because you listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you saying, you shall not eat from it. God places the blame for sin squarely upon Adam's shoulders. Adam and Adam alone is the one who is responsible for his own actions and for this curse being called upon him and all of his offspring. 
Now notice what is cursed here. Notice what is cursed. The ground is cursed. The nature of the labor is cursed. The food or the challenge of getting food is cursed. And Adam's body is cursed. Look at this. Verse 17. Cursed is the ground because of you. Thorns and, thi- or, I'm sorry, in toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles that will grow for you. So verse 18 re- explains to us how the ground was cursed. Now we will have thorns and thistles that will grow and it will increase the difficulty with which Adam is able to get food. The nature of the labor has changed as well. In toil, you will eat of it. Some of your versions may say in sorrow, all right, you will eat of it. What this basically means is labor becomes difficult. Now, labor was a good part of God's creation. We were designed to work. Look back, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. Work is good. Work is to be joyful. Work brings pleasure and satisfaction. But now work is going to be sorrowful. It is going to be difficult. And the, the evidence for that is the challenge of getting food. Look at the second half of verse 18. You will eat the plants of the field. No longer will you be able to just walk up to the tree and pull the fruit from any tree that God has given you in the art garden and be able to eat from that. No, can't do that anymore. It's not a one-step process. It's a two or three or four step process to get your food. You have to labor in the soil. You have to grow the food. You have to weed the food. Then you have to harvest the food and then turn it into food. So you harvest the plant, then you turn it into food. So we went from a one step process. You see the fruit of any tree, except this one. See the fruit of any tree, go pick that and eat it. Okay, sounds like a plan. Not that anymore. Now it becomes difficult to labor for food. And finally, Adam's body bears the evidence of the curse. By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Here, Adam receives confirmation of what he initially thought. He initially expected to die physically right away. But now God says, you're going to have to labor. You're going to have to toil to eat all the days of your life. And then once your life is over, your body is going to decay and turn back into dust because from dust you were made. Adam didn't know how long he was going to live. I can only begin to imagine the sorrow that he felt living 962 years and seeing the effect of sin, the curse of sin, play out in creation over the course of his 962 years. What should we say from this? Well, as a people who are now living under the curse of sin, we should expect difficulties in our work, but we should also have the right attitude. We should view the thorns in the garden, okay, the figurative thorns in the garden, as God's means of sanctifying us into Christ's likeness. We should expect that things will not work out the way we plan, but we should use that as an example to model and practice the fruits of the Spirit rather than growing angry and frustrated. And we are also reminded of our finiteness. We see death invade the regular experience of life. And every person in this auditorium has been touched by death in some way, shape, or form. Death at the right time, and also death at the wrong time. A premature death. A death that you did not expect. What then shall we say in response to these things? I have two questions, actually three questions to ask you. Is there a sin that you're hiding? Is there a sin that is broken fellowship with your fellow man? What keeps you from confessing it? A hard heart? Stubbornness? Pride? Don't do that. Don't be like Adam. The second question, relating to the general effects of the curse of sin. How do you battle those? 
How do you think about putting into practice the truths from God's word in order to fight the effects of the curse of sin? All the ladies in the auditorium, you have a consequence that's been given to you. How are you doing at overcoming that? Gentlemen, we face the consequence of sin in our daily work. How are you doing at overcoming the consequences of sin? How are you growing in Christ-likeness? Are you allowing the natural effects of sin in the world to shape you into Christ-likeness by transforming your response, or are they embittering you? Don't be embittered. Don't be embittered. Rather, allow yourself to be transformed and look forward with hope, the hope of life eternal, that if you have put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, if you have confessed your sins, you can be confident that you will escape bondage in this life and you will escape the eternal consequences of sin, that is hell, and you will enjoy eternal life with Jesus our Savior. Let's pray.